Can I turn to Sébastien? Thank you, Jean Claude. <laughs> Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to share a few thoughts about uh, the way the world economy interacts with uh, world politics somehow. My starting point would be uh, will be to observe that what makes probably the present situation quite unique is uh, the intensification of grid power competition in a context of uh, close uh, inter economic and financial interdependence. Uh, this has uh, translated uh, recently in a situation where we see that the multilateral frameworks are somehow destabilized and overwhelmed, as witnessed by the spread of uh, economic <coughs> restrictions uh, on trade and uh, investment flows, of uh, exceptional duties, uh, tariff duties on uh, the spread of economic sanctions, uh, and so on. Um, on the sp mm, witnessed also uh, by the, the, the spread, the, the spread, sorry, of um, uh, uncoordinated uh, uh, industrial policies and, and state uh, increased state interventionism. So this is a, um, a situation uh, marked by uh, increasing geopolitical tensions, but I think it's fair to say that at least until now, the result has not been, uh, at least not to a large extent, uh, it has not been decoupling or fragmentation. We've seen a kind of plateauing, and Gabriel uh, uh, showed it in, in figures a moment ago, in terms of the intensity of world trade, uh, but there is no established trend toward decline in economic and financial uh, relations at the, at the world level. There are some, case, some, uh, um, some cases, some specific places where this is uh, indeed uh, there is uh, um, uh, a decline. Uh, and this is, for instance, the case in, um, in terms of the bilateral trade relationship between the US and China for well understood reasons. But it is remarkable that even in that case, for instance, study after study, it is shown that when the intensity of direct trade between the US and China is declining, uh, indirect trade is actually uh, increasing, meaning that uh, the US is sourcing less imports from China, it will be sourcing more from variety of countries, say Vietnam, Mexico, for instance, and these countries themselves source, are sourcing more uh, components from China, meaning that aiming at decoupling what we are observing actually is not decoupling of fragmentation, it's more diversion with uh, ensuing costs and opacity. And questions about uh, uh, whether uh, uh, this is reducing in any, in any meaningful terms uh, uh, risk or, or uh, um, degree of dependence. So I think we, we somehow we have to live with this inter economic and financial interdependence. Of course, the situation of geopolitical tensions and economic interdependence create a very strong temptation to leverage interdependencies for political purposes, to weaponize them. And I think that's really a, a difficult uh, uh, defining feature of the present situation. But it's also a very difficult uh, objective. Difficult because economic and financial exchanges are defined by a principle of mutual benefits. They are taking place because they are benefiting both parties, meaning that it is very difficult for one of them to uh, usefully leverage uh, them. When is it possible? Well, when there is a situation with a very pronounced asymmetry. Uh, um, and only in such case is it possible really to efficiently leverage uh, these economic and financial interdependencies. And I think this is the reason why in the uh, recent examples of weaponization of economic dependencies, we are seeing the increasing importance, the, the overwhelming importance of finance of information and knowledge, because these are uh, dependent, dependent interdependencies, uh, uh, these are activities that rely uh, upon very concentrated networks. 
think, uh, the monetary si think about the monetary system with the role of the dollar, think about international banking transaction with the role of the SWIFT uh, uh, system, think about information with social networks or uh, uh, about high-tech and semiconductors, for, uh, for instance, with uh, intellectual properties. In every each, each of these cases, you have very complex networks where a, a, a few shock points, as uh, Henry Farrell and Abe Newman uh, have called them, are uh, taking uh, a central importance and can be uh, leveraged and have been leveraged uh, for many of them recently. So it's a situation that in a recent paper uh, uh, published uh, together with uh, uh, Thomas Gomar, we uh, define as geofinance, meaning uh, to, to reflect the fact that it is marked by an increasing politicization of financial and information flows. And it's somehow different from what we used to uh, think in terms of geoeconomic competition in the 1990s or the 2000s, which was mainly taking place within the framework uh, of multilateral institutions. Here, in many cases, uh, uh, this, uh, um, this competition and this uh, um, weaponization is in breach of uh, international commitments. So, I think it is not surprising, given this uh, uh, situation, that economic security is becoming an overarching concern for uh, governments. Um, with mainly two uh, objectives. The first one is to reduce vulnerability and build leverage uh, with regard to this uh, shock point, to these critical nodes in the world economy. And the second one is to control or at least master to some extent foundational technologies. And here I think the interaction is very strong with climate change because climate change is already an ongoing revolution in terms of for industry, for trade, for raw materials and, and uh, uh, energy. It's redefining the, the key technologies, it's redefining the, the, the way markets are, <coughs> uh, are working. So, uh, the, the challenge today for many governments uh, is how to um, uh, reach, a co how to improve economic security. In a context where increasingly, for the reasons I described, they are not considering international markets, world markets, as secure enough. In a context as well, I think it's worth emphasizing that where isolation is clearly not the solution for two main reasons. The first one is efficiency. International division of labor is a sine qua non of efficiency today, especially for uh, sophisticated technologies. And the second one uh, could be term, uh, a was term a relational power by, by Susan Strange, the need to have allies or at least to have partners to support your views. And we see that in this context of tension, this is <coughs> increasingly important. So uh, relational power, requires openness, requires uh, 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 significant economic and financial relationships. Um, so, uh, this is a challenge. I think it is um, uh, really important to emphasize as well that uh, increasingly the response of governments um, is uh, uh, using more ambitious, uh, more widespread industrial policies um, and uh, it's worth as well uh, uh, emphasizing that while uh, in the 80s, for instance, will be uh, economists were commenting uh, a lot the fact that uh, some policies were used as, as a, a, a way to kind of uh, appropriate rents as rent shifting policies. This is a typical example for that was uh, the competition uh, uh, between Airbus and Boeing and the, the efforts of government to somehow appropriate the, the, the oligopolistic rent in this sector. Today, it's more about control, about power, than about rent. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the same kind of logic I is taking place, uh, a logic where uh, every, everyone is trying to appropriate and everyone needs to somehow to retaliate to what others are doing. So I'll conclude just in, uh, by emphasizing the, the threats um, uh, involved in these trends. The threats, of course, are additional and useless costs from an economic, uh, economic point of view. 
linked to these additional obstacles and constraints. It's also in the additional rigidities uh, uh, ensuing from, from these constraints, and I think that uh, uh, means a lot in terms of uh, adjustment capacity for the world economy in the time to come, with, of course, a, a significant risk of escalation. All this uh, for a benefit which uh, we, we can discuss it, but I think so far uh, is very limited in terms of uh, uh, de-risking, uh, as uh, uh, the term, the fashionable term uh, put it. And the, finally, the, the last and probably most dangerous threat is that all these uh, uh, constraints jeopardize the capacity of coordination at the world level. So I think the, this is a very important challenge in terms of economic governance globally. And I think part of the re response should lie uh, around r somehow ring fencing uh, the security concerns in the world uh, economy and the world finance. And um, as a precondition, probably to uh, update coordination and rules in other sectors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sebastian. I, I take it that your exploration of the uh, impact on global economy and trade in particular, and also the over, overall industrial diversification associated with the tensions associated with this will to de-risk to uh, have a, a world in which we would uh, incorporate uh, uh, precisely these major changes in the global tensions is something which is very important. I take it that uh, uh, with uh, global trade uh, being under the impact of this uh, French-shoring, uh, re-shoring, uh, or whatever, of course, it has a cost, first, and second, it has uh, an impact on the global growth, and it has also an impact on inflation, to be frank. So uh, all this is intertwined in a way which is very striking. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Sebastian.